my audience is anybody who's tired of the very robotic and inhuman <laughs> way that people do business, right? So I don't know, I don't know if that's a good, a broad enough, if that's too broad, but I think you know who I'm talking about. Like that's one of the reasons I followed your stuff um, yeah. for so long is I just, I started in sales about four or five, I guess five years ago now, right out of college yeah. and um, just very quickly was so disgusted slash just exhausted by the constant barrage yeah. of nonsense coming out of the sales industry. And even like all these, like I was reading all the books you're supposed to read. And I, I was just yeah. like, this is crazy stuff. Humans yeah. don't function this way. So um, <laughs> I just, I've been on a mission. Like our company, why <clears throat> is basically to make marketing a more human endeavor for businesses. Yeah. And yeah. so I figured I'm trying to connect with people, not like with any kind of specific, well, if you do marketing or you do sales or you do anything, it's more right. like, are you someone whose mindset is we should all be human people doing business together and not like, how do I get somebody to respond? How do I push the right buttons? How do you know what I mean? How do I get my yeah. cash flow right or whatever? I don't know. That's yeah. how I explain it. No, that makes sense. One of the things, you know, so for the past, whatever, you know, 15, 20 years, I would say up until, you know, recently, I've, I've identified as and been known very much as, you know, called a sales thought leader, right? And, and I ran a consulting company and we, uh, we pioneered a bunch of really, really cool stuff in terms of developing talent and, you know, outbound calling and, and whatever. Um, about five or six years ago, I really started to see, and, and, and I'll, I'll pause on that real quick. And I've always had what I would consider a very rational humanistic approach to selling, right? It was always very much a serve and then sell versus sell. Um, right. Mahan, Mahan Khalsa, who, uh, who wrote what I think is the best sales book ever written called Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play, had a great expression. And, and what he used to say is, how I sell is an example of how I serve, right? So when somebody's you know, aggressive and pushy and all the things people think about salespeople, disrespectful, what have you, that's not, an, that's not a good indication of what's, what life's going to be like after, afterwards, right? right? Uh, there's my wife going in the background. I forgot to tell her we were recording something. <laughs> Hi, wife. <laughs> <laughs> she could be in the video too. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things going on right now is being on conference calls with people and their kids. Like, I just think it's great. Like, people have their kids and I'm like, right on, bring your kid, man. Who yeah, gives a shit? I've been enjoying but, that as well. I know. I've been enjoying yeah. that as well. Like this my whole, son's like oh, banging on the door a couple you, times. You can't see my like, family. Oh. Yeah, it's like, give it a break, dude. Who cares? We all have a life. I know. So, I mean, yeah. Oh, you're high. There, there was that one video that came out on the internet of some guy in a conference call and his wife like sneaking in to like get the kid out and stuff. And like made the, everybody got, I mean, just like, oh. I know. I know, dude. I'm right there with you. I, I have, right I have we'll, we'll get into that, but I have, I have a lot of hopefulness about how all of this is going to transform our lives for the better. Um, yeah. so we can talk about that in a little bit. So anyway, one of, one of, one of the secrets to my success is I didn't enter, you know, the real professional workforce until later. I didn't have my first real job until I was 27. I raced bikes, rolled burritos, farted around, you know, got drunk gotcha. every night. And then one day I'm like, all right, I should probably get a job. I had a college education, but I'm like, I'm not going off to, you know, Boston or New York, like everybody else I went to school with and just go, yeah, I want to go fun. So I was like 27 before I started getting exposed to, you know, the real world. And the I was like, what? world. I was like, Whatever what that is means. this? What is this crap? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> and, you know, I just didn't give a shit. So I just would be myself. And, you know, I sold. I was really successful. And when people did stupid shit, I would tell them it's stupid. And you know, nobody did that, right? You didn't actually speak your mind. And then, you know, and, and usually I was coming from a place of wanting to help. And then when, um, you know, when things got really weird or, or my boss was an idiot, I'd quit. And then they'd hire me back and pay more money. And it was just this, <laughs> it was just this surreal experience of like, like watching right. office space, you know, where right. the guy's just like, yeah, this is dumb. And everybody's like, oh my God, he's so, he's so out of the box thinker. I'm like, no, you're stupid. Anyway, so that was, that was, that was a fun little, little journey. But very quickly, I realized I hate this, right? I was making a lot right. of money. I went from, you know, rolling burritos and bike shops to a VP at a fortune 500 in like six years. 
but I was waking up on Sunday morning with a pit in my stomach thinking about having to deal with all this nonsense and just this, this, this stupidity. So I quit, started my own company, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I've always had this, you know, we'll look at a situation and, and you know, one of my favorite things to say is selling is easy. Just wake up every day and pretend you're going to go out and talk to other human beings. <laughs> it's not that hard. I like and, to pretend. And, uh, yeah. Right. Cause you actually are. What if, what if what you did yeah. was actually so <clears throat> spoke to other humans? <laughs> yeah. Um, one of my favorite books, by the way, is, uh, Patrick Lencioni's, um, I think it's called getting naked and it, and okay. it, you know, he writes those business fables, but yeah. it, it, it probably in, in one book encapsulates for me just how, you know, how to best go out and, and, and meet the world. And that is right. from a place of vulnerability, from a place of honesty, not trying to, you know, to look good. You know, people say, well, what if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? Well, you just say you don't know and you go find <laughs> out. <laughs> it's really tough. Right. I'll get back so, to you. So, you know, I, I had this really wonderful career working with companies and teaching them and their people how to, how to do better, how to sell better and how to, how to grow your revenue by really serving better, by serving people fully. And about five or six years ago, and, and a lot of this was prompted by some of my own, I don't know, I'll say transformational experiences and, and lessons learned growing older. Um, in the last time things went wacky, uh, 2009, um, I had to shut down my company, uh, my marriage fell apart. And by that, I mean, I broke it and, uh, I, you know, <laughs> had to declare bankruptcy. So like, you know, my whole life got really scraped to the ground a decade ago. Um, and it was the best thing that ever happened because it, it, it forced me to look inside, right. For the first time really in my life and look at, you know, what's going on inside. And I'll say about five or six years ago, I started integrating the stuff that I was learning and doing with my, with my, what's called sales coaching work, sales, sales consulting work. And the way I like to explain it is I'd been obsessed for, you know, almost two decades with, let's call it the application layer, right? How do you cold call? How do you, how do you run meetings? How do you do discovery? All this, all this stuff, right? And I was always somewhat perplexed at, at first of all, why people needed me to tell them what to do. Cause it was just sort of obvious. I was like, well, I'll just do it this way. Cause that makes sense. And like, wow, I never thought of it that way. I'm like, Hmm. Okay. Right. So that was like, that was like one. And, and the other thing that really amazed me or surprised me was how hard it was for folks, how difficult it was for folks. And, and one example for at least 15 years, I've been teaching people how to follow the, 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 the maxim, never leave a conversation, a meeting without a scheduled next meeting. It's sort of core to my philosophy. If you're selling the idea of follow-up is just bananas. Right. If I, if I deliver, if I'm delivering a proposal to you and then I have to chase you to talk about that proposal, that just, that's always right. seemed bizarre. So I've been teaching this shit for 15 years, eBooks on it, webinars on it, process docs, how do you handle it? Like every little possible detail, go in and teach a whole company how to do it. Come back six later, six months later and nobody's doing it anymore. Right. Right. And you're like, what is going on? Why is this so right. difficult? And long story short, what I started to get a glimpse of was, oh, the application's never going to work if the operating system isn't functioning, right? right. And right. I just kept seeing more and more that, that the real challenge was not what the salespeople were doing, but how they saw themselves, right? Their self-image, you know, the beliefs that they held. You know, people talk about things like confidence and, you know, right. all those things. But really for me, it's, 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 how does the world show up for you, right? Does it show up as, as inherently safe and secure and you can have fun or does it show up as I got to work every day to not, you know, fall down a hole or, you know, right. ruin everything. Right. And, and I really started integrating what, what a lot of folks would call, you know, mindfulness work or mindset work into the sales process um, and into my training. And, and it was unbelievable. Like, Unbelievable. People, people, people who, you know, just appeared stuck and, and were just failing. When you, when you could unscramble, help them unscramble and unlock the potential that was actually sitting in there, but was blocked because of how they saw themselves, how they saw the world, what have you. Right. It was like creating superheroes. Right. 
And, right. and that was even more fun. And it, it was all the more frustrating to me why, you know, so many companies, they, you know, they, they hire folks, they, they I, I can't even call what they do, any level of training, you know, they throw them into the mix and say, figure it out. And then, right. you know, blame them and fire them when they can't be successful. Right. Right. And it's just, it's, it's, it's tragic to me, right? Because there's so much toll on their psyche and people's sense of self-worth. And you know, I talk to people all the time. We're like, I, I just suck at this. I'm like, no, you don't suck. You've literally never been taught how to do this, <laughs> how to do it out here, or even how to think about this, right? Right, right. So, you know, if somebody puts you in an operating room and say, hey, do some brain surgery, yeah, it's not right. going to go well, right? Right. And then if they yell at you for killing a bunch of people, it's like, wow, this is dysfunctional. So, <laughs> yes. two, two, that's, yeah. That's what- that, that is was my, whole, is, yeah. my first three jobs. That was it. That was just it. And I was like, what is going on? How do these people that are like leading this company think that this makes any sense whatsoever? I mean, like the sec, like I watched a company burn about half a million dollars and like 10 sales guys in seven months. And I was like, what in the name of yeah. rationality is happening right now? <laughs> well, so, so this is actually a pretty interesting segue because You can, you can only, you, you can't help the unwilling, right? And what you see in these organizations is scared and, and, and dysfunctional leadership making decisions from that place, right? So right. I actually have a lot of sympathy for the same folks that I make fun of for, you know, really doing it wrong because they're suffering from the same core challenges, you know, that everybody else is, right? So right they're th- they're doing the best they can with the thinking that they have so you know this just gets us to about a couple of years ago i i made a very conscious decision that i wanted to move from being a consultant who would sneak in some coaching to truly a coach and to serve folks really from the inside out um and interesting initially i thought i would i would really be done with the whole sales consulting stuff and you know, sales process and design. And turns out after about three or four months of just doing, you know, what I would call really high level transformative coaching, I was kind of bored, right? Cause I actually <laughs> really enjoy, you know, working with people on the game called let's grow our company. Let's make more money. I've got, you know, probably a dozen companies that I've worked with that have exited in the past decade and, you know, hundreds and hundreds that have grown. So I love that stuff. So I, I've, I've gotten to, you know, move into this really interesting space where, um, I love that coaching relationship. And in fact, I don't, I don't really want to work with a company where I'm not working one-on-one with the CEO or the founder or whoever it is right. to help them unlock potential. But I also love getting into the, you know, the nuts and bolts of the sales organization. I've been having so many fun conversations in the past couple of weeks with companies about what they should be doing right now, what they can do to set themselves up and also what they should not be doing. Right. And I'm, I'm secretly, I guess it's not a secret because I'm saying it, I'm really excited because this is kind of forcing everybody back off doing all the stupid shit that wasn't working anyway. You know, right. the merciless cold calling, <clears throat> pitching to get a demo to do a proposal that ends in a yep. no decision that you're yep. following up on. I'm like, I don't care how many BDRs and SDRs you have. I don't care how many appointments you set. What's your, what's your close rate off proposals? And the answer is like nothing, right? right? So yeah, it's like the 400 cold calls to one conversation to, (laughs) I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, I'm kind of glad everybody's going to have to reinvent and there's no, you know, here's the formula for it. And if you just follow these five steps and people are going to have to actually get human. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I yeah. got an email yesterday. I, for about six months now, ever since we, we went full-time, I went full-time with my company, I've just been hammering basically this statement that if, like we're content marketers, so it's a little different than sales guys, but to me, it's the exact <clears throat> same premise, which is yeah. give everything away for free. And then the people who know the value of that will trust yeah. you and buy from you, right? That's the, yeah. the simple... And I've been saying that for about six months now. And, and this guy sent me an email and he goes, hey, these guys are starting to get on board too. And he'd sent me this guy and What's, what I think is funny is exactly what you just said. I was saying to my business partner earlier, which was uh, I've been saying for six months, 
this is what you need to do if you want to start conversations and build real relationships. And now yeah. that everyone can see how silly it is to continue to sell the way they were with all this <laughs> going on, I'm like, all that's happened is you see how silly it was. It wasn't any less silly six months ago yeah. or all this yeah. last time. It's just, you can yeah. see it now. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, it's, 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 it's blatantly obvious how dumb right. you've been. Stop, like, I mean, all these people that are like, well, so now the coronavirus has got you trapped inside. And it's like, dude, what is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, that, that's sort of where I'm turning my attention to folks is helping them figure out, okay, what exactly can you do, right? Because people, right. people are really stuck in their thinking about that. I was talking to uh, a gentleman last week, and he works for a uh, – they, they sell uh, workers' compensation insurance, and his customers are small uh, agencies. He's, he's in the channel side of things. So he sells to agency owners with like, you know, 10, 15 you know, insurance agents or less. He said, well, what, what can I be doing? I'm like, well, what are the top, you know, two or three problems, challenges that your customer is wrestling with right now? He goes, you mean with, with respect to insurance? I'm like, no, just the problems that they're dealing with. What right. are they dealing with? Right. He goes, well, you know, honestly, these guys, their challenge is they're trying to figure out how to have the people work from home and they're, they're not very sophisticated. They have like you know, shitty computers and a lot of paper. They don't know how to use Zoom. I said, cool. Call up an agency owner. Say, hey, are you trying to get your people up on Zoom? Give me a list of them. I'll train them. All right? It doesn't have to be related to anything you're going to sell them. It's find out how to help. When you help people, right, A, it's not a bad way to spend your day, right? It's a really great right. way to go through your day helping people. Right. They tend to build relationships and credibility and all those things that matter. And yeah, not all of them are going to turn into business, but who cares, right. right? My whole life, I've never worried about closing a deal. I've worried about building a relationship and serving somebody. What do they need? Now, you know, obviously I don't spend all my time helping people that are never going to be customers, but we're smart enough to figure that out. You know? Right. Just use some common mm -hmm. sense. Well, and what do you think about this? Because th this is something that's been crossing my mind is too. I mean, I think people's memories are a little longer than guys in the sales and marketing industry give them credit for like i think on the other side of this people are going to remember the guys that were pounding on their door annoying them and they remember the guy that called them and said what can i do right i mean i don't think anybody's really in a buying position right now like most people just biologically are a little too worried to be like having yeah. that conversation so it's like yeah. don't focus i see it as like you can't focus on who's going to buy now so focus on who's going to remember how you behaved now right that's to me is what is what matters yeah. about it. hundred percent. And right. And there's, there's how you behave. There's also one of the things I talk a lot about is, is the concept of a customer journey. Right. And the simplest version is people don't wake up and say, Oh, I'm going to buy something today. Right. They, they, they wake up and, and they might have uncovered or, or discovered a problem. Right. Something's not working. Well, they move then, you know, once they've kind of uncovered it, they move then to a stage I call learning. They learn about the problem, learn about solutions. And only then sometime later, do they move into this, you know, I'm going to solve for the problem stage. And that's when you buy. You buy when you're ready to solve. Nobody's pressing the buy button right now. Right. But the problems still exist. And ironically, they have time to do learning. Right. <laughs> it's kind of cool. So right. if you're out there hammering people on, you know, proposals and presentations and demos and stuff, trying to get them to sell, well, you're burning a lot of energy. You'll get some. Right. But I want to focus on the discover and the learn phase. And part of that is simply, you know, building goodwill and relationships and have you. But the other part of it is I've been encouraging, you know, folks I'm talking to, this is the time when you can 10x your audience, right? Of people that you can nurture and then sell to later, right? And stay on their radar, you know, with, with content, with webinars, with whatever you're doing, Right? Your right. metric should be, how are you going to grow your audience? And again, I use that word audience intentionally. If you're thinking about prospects and customers, your mind's not in the right place. Think right. like a performer. Think like an artist. Right? Right. The size of your audience matters. You can release an album later and charge them. But build the right. audience now. What can you do? What can you deliver that keeps them coming to your page on social, that gets them on your opt-in list? You know, whatever it is. And grow your audience because they'll need you later. And when they're ready, right? And that's, that's, the, that's the funniest thing to me. The concept of accelerating a sale or closing a customer has been nonsense for a decade. People buy when they're fucking ready to buy.
<laughs> and I can't, and I can't control that. And, and all the shit I do to give oh you a discount God. or make either makes me look weak or douchey. Yeah. Right. I, I, I agree so much. Like all the ur- create, you got to create urgency. You got to, <laughs> okay, I'll go burn their fucking office down. How about that? Then they'll need then the Right. It's like, yeah, that's, that's not how it works. Right. That's literally, I mean, that's what it, that's what you're left with in some of these, you know, the logical conclusion is basically like go cut all of your go call it, cut all your customers cable and then <clears> and then offer to sell them a new cable. I mean, yeah, go, oh, go, man, steal, yeah, go so, steal their TV and then try to sell it back to them. <laughs> right, it's just ridiculous. So, um, although people are doing that right now with some of this Purell stuff, so yeah, um, so I've seen a couple of your posts that you put up, Townsend, about uh, some stuff that I thought was interesting. One of them was yeah. you, you said, you know, you're not going back to work as soon as you think. So mm. I'm kind of curious, like, could you expound on that a little bit more, like? I, I mean, that's something I, my situation has barely changed at all. Cause I yeah. just already worked remotely and I run my own company. Yeah. So I'm not like about to lose my job or anything, yeah. but for folks who are either sales guys or just whatever they are. Right. And they're sitting here with sitting on their hands now, maybe they got suspended. Maybe they got furloughed. Maybe they just got fired. Um, you know, what, how should they be thinking about this time that they're in right now? Yeah. So this is obviously a sensitive topic because you know, people are, people are nervous and scared. So I'm always you know, cautious and how I, how I explain it, but there's some, there's some facts that people have to realize, right? One is cash flow lags in B2B cash flow is, is a lagging indicator. So if you're a business owner, let's just say you, 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 you minimally, you know, laid off folks. You try to, I know a lot of business owners that try to try to keep as many people as possible you know, did a, did a, did a pay decrease so they can keep as many, but you're burning cash right now, right? No matter how you look at it, you're burning cash. There's also the aspect of nobody wants to kind of be the company that laid people off in, you know, a crisis. So right. there's, there's, there's sort of right. a moral imperative, if you will, and a, and a social imperative to, uh, you know, to do the best you can. Well, let's, let's just pretend that by the end of May, we get the, Hey, we're all good. Ever go back to work? I don't, you know, I don't know if it's going to be end of April, end of May, June. It doesn't really matter. Right. At some point, we can go back to normal. Well, that doesn't mean everybody comes back on and gets put on the payroll. Why? There's no cash. Right. And if you own a restaurant, you can hire a server because that server is going to turn their labor into money that day. Right. right. Pipelines have been decimated. Right. And, and nobody's going to start buying on day one. There's going to be a lagging cycle here. So my direst prediction is actually we're going to see more layoffs, right? We're not going to see more hiring. We're going to see more layoffs June, July, August because, well, I'm not going to you know, make the headlines for cutting somebody in the middle of a crisis. And I've got a, a legitimate case. Now, that might be extended a little bit with some of this government money. There's, there's actually some you know, it's a mixed bag as always with stuff politicians do, but there's some genuinely good stuff for small business in there. But likely we'll see some net, you know, layoffs. And as the hiring comes back, and it will, it's going to come back in stages, right? You'll, you'll say, okay, well, this, this quarter, what can we afford to bring back based on our cat? Okay, we'll do the next, next quarter, what have you. And they're going to be selective about who they're bringing back, right? Right. They, they need to, you know, basically rank order folks and figure out who's going to be the, the most capable of turning that, that investment into, into cash. Um, it's going to be an opportunity, frankly, for a lot of companies to up-level, you know, their, their sales force. And the other, you know, again, it, it's unfortunate, right? The, the, the BDR, SDR role has created incredible opportunity for folks to get into sales and, and make real income and, and, and get on the career path. Um, I was, I was actually, you know, on the, on the very front lines of this, like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, I was part of what my company did. We actually, we weren't, they weren't called BDRs then, but we were, we were hiring folks and training them as an, as a BDR effectively what they call it now to set appointments. We would employ them uh, and contract out, you know, kind of an outsourced basis, but then they'd get hired. So, I'm a big fan of that role. I would say, you know, there, there's a couple right. of folks who who invented that role. When I was selling this as a service, it didn't exist. So pretty confident I get a place at that table. But the point is, it's gone bananas, right? This idea of right. well, we're just going to keep throwing BDRs and SDRs at the problem. Right. Well, 
the, 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 the veneer has come off. So you're going to see a whole, I suspect, class of sales role decimated, right? It's not going to go away, but you know, I was, I was predicting this, I think three years ago that, you know, the SDR role, but it's unsustainable. You can't just, you can't simply keep hiring folks, you know, to dial, right. And to throw shit against the wall because eventually the wall stops noticing that there's any more right. shit being thrown at it. And that's what's happening, right. you know, dial right. to connect rate, et cetera. So you're, you're going to see a real lagging indicator here. So, so the question then comes down, okay, what do you do about it? If you're right. a salesperson, what do you do? Well, um, that's a good question, but core to that has to be, uh, how are you going to make yourself more valuable? Right. I am constantly astounded Right. I, I will point fingers at companies and say, you suck. You don't train people. You're not doing your job. But I'll also point my finger at the people and say, what are you doing? Right. To, to better yourself. Better. Well, I'm on LinkedIn. No, that's not, that's social media. That's, that's farting around. Right. What books right. are you reading? What courses are you taking? What thought leaders are you consuming rapidly? You know, that legitimately would put you in a better position. Right. Um, also, from a timing standpoint, right? Think of it, think of it like what we saw with, you know, as, as people woke up to the fact that, oh, um, we're gonna be stuck in our house. Everybody runs to the grocery store, right? And there's no toilet paper, and there's long lines, and it's a pain in the ass. Well, right. that's gonna happen with hiring too. If you think getting rehired or getting a new job starts when this whole thing is over, Go watch a couple of videos of, you know, supermarkets and toilet paper because it's going to be like that. So the people that are out there now targeting new companies, building relationships with hiring managers, sales managers, right? They've got the opportunity to be right. So now imagine you're a sales manager and, and the good news is you're back to work. The good news is the CEO just said, okay, you get to bring three more back. Talk to HR and blah, 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 blah. And the next morning, you got 150, if not 300 resumes on your desk. You're like, ah. Right, right. Or right. there's John and Jim and Mary, you know, who you've been engaging with, you know, for two months, right? Who you think are pretty sharp, who have told you they, you know, love a job someday at your company. They want to work, right? And, and you know who they are and you've, you've interacted with them and whatever, whatever your strategy is. Well, they're going to skip that pile of resumes and call the people that they know. Right. So that could be, you know, go, even going back to the job you had, right. You got to realize they're going to have to make hiring decisions and, and they're going to make those decisions based on who they feel most comfortable with. So to me, it really is outreach. What are you doing to extend your network to people that are going to be beneficial to you? And then what are you doing to develop your skills, your knowledge? And, and how are you letting that be known? Right. Right. That's the other side of it. It can't just be, oh, I'm reading a bunch of books, but that's a start. Um, you know, how do you share that knowledge so that people go, wow, that, that person's pretty smart. 20, that's probably more than 20 years ago. One of the things I used to love to do because I was consuming, you know, business books pretty voraciously is I would, I'd write up a book summary about it, right? We didn't have all this cool, you know, post on LinkedIn and stuff. I would just put together a book summary and email it to people and be like, hey, I did this. What do you think? You know, it might be useful for you. Right? How do you take what you learn and spin it back out to something that is value creating for somebody else? And that's, that's building your brand essentially as a value creator, as somebody, right. you know, who gets it. Yeah. I mean, something I've been doing is creating <clears throat> content for small businesses, that, right? It's like, I see this all on the other side of this. I see this being the new normal. So it's like, don't think of this as how are you going to market for the next three months? Think of this yeah. as how are you yeah. developing your new like this new economical approach to your marketing. Cause it's going to be similar to this moving forward. Yeah. But I would imagine for like a sales guy, something would be like, I mean, if you, if you developed a sales process, like if, you know, based on like how you yeah. see outreach making sense on the other side of this, right in this situation you're talking about, yeah. and you start sharing that with guys who are sales VPs, <clears throat> they're going to yeah. need sales guys when they're done. Right. How does that build your value when he's got, you know, he's getting messages from you being like, Hey dude, just something to think about. Here's some yeah. noodling I've been doing on like how yep. sales teams can win in June when this all goes back to normal. Yeah. I mean, it's all I, about just practicing what you preach and showing that you know what you're yeah. talking about. And getting creative. I, I, I got to, you know, I've been putting stuff out on LinkedIn just saying, hey, if, if, if you want some help brainstorming this, let me know. And I got a 
I got a message from one guy saying, yeah, I've been, I've been looking for work, you know, applying and obviously now it's all shut down right now. And I'm like, okay, well, yeah, so you can keep sending out resumes and that's a waste of your time. I said, do you know what kind of companies you want to work for? And he's like, yeah, I'm like, cool. Make a list of 20 of them and start reaching out to them and offer to help, right? What do you do? I'm, I'm a, you know, he said, SDR. Okay, cool. You set appointments. Tell me you work for free. You're not doing anything anyway, right? Like, tell me, I want to work for your company and I'm willing to, you know, right. put in some time now. I'm sitting at home anyway, right? If you're any good. And again, it's that, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not a fan of working for free, obviously, but there are times when it just makes sense to give and serve right. and, and let, let everything else sort itself out because it usually does, right? So. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can ever mm. go wrong by doing the right thing. <laughs> right, yeah. And it's, <laughs> I mean. It kind of is that, you know, call, call it karma or whatever you want to call it. You know, my, my entire career and all my success has simply been going, okay, what, what seems like the right thing to do here, right? In service of, and it's not about putting yourself last or putting yourself in jeopardy, but it is about just, just lowering a little bit this, this desperate need we have, you know, to make sure we're okay. Like and make sure we're going to get ours. And, you know, I, I get that inclination. I understand where that comes from, but it, but it really doesn't serve us because when I'm sitting across from somebody, you, anybody, you're going to know in probably, you know, a 10th or a hundredth of a second, am I here to give or am I here to take? Right. right. And you know, that's not, that's neither bad nor good, but you're going to form an impression very quickly of where I'm coming from. And our entire relationship shifts based on that premise. Right. Right. I, I, I find it most amusing when, when people are rattled or just really confused by, I was talking to a guy last week and he reached out to me and we chatted for a few minutes. I said, well, would you like, you know, me to, spend an hour or so coaching you. And he's like, well, you know, what's, what's your pitch? I'm like, well, there's no pitch. I said, I'm not, not looking to charge. He's like, well, wait, wait, what's in it for you? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe nothing. It seems like you could use some help and that's what I do. It also seems like you're not somebody who's going to pay my rates because they're expensive. So I can do two things. I can say, fuck off. Or I can say, I'll help you. And right. A little voice in my head said, offer to help. So I'll do it. Don't worry about it. Right. It'll take, it always takes care of itself, you right. know, right. but we're afraid, right? When we, when we, when we come from a place of scarcity, when all the stories around us and everything that reinforces us is, you know, things are bad and getting worse and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. We, we, we start to operate from a place of fear and it just, it just shuts down our creativity. It shuts down everything. And it's, it's sort of funny going from, from, from consulting to coaching and, and making that pivot, you know, I had my bouts of, of fear and insecurity. Is this going to work? Right. I had, I had a very successful consulting practice and could have done that for the rest of my life. Right. It was an unanswered question. Are people going to pay me or, and certainly pay me the same amount for coaching? I don't know. And what gave me a lot of peace was I said, well, you know, I've made a lot of money and been happy and I've made a lot of money and been unhappy. Right. It, 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 unhappy is unhappy. I'd rather just be happy. So right. happy making money, like to, to put it simply, I'd rather be making less money and be happy than making more money and be unhappy. So right. worst case scenario is, you know, I'm, I'm homeless, which is not a real scenario, but I get to spend every day doing something that's meaningful and fulfilling and deeply gratifying. Right. And the chances and the chances that, if that's what you're doing and serving, you're going to be on the street or actually zero. That's the funny part is we think in these terms of hyperbole, well, I, I, I got to pay my bills. I'm going to be on the street. Really? That's right. it's A or B here. Is that really it? Or is this, or is this just maybe not one less steak right. dinner a week or, you know, maybe buy the $20 bottle of wine instead of the $50. Right? I, I don't, th right. I don't think you, and I, I have to, I have to kind of smack right. some of my clients on it. Like, Oh, so, so really, you know, 
here we are now, and the next, the next logical situation is you'll be homeless, right? That's just, right. you know, that's what's next. Right. Knock, and knock that's it also off. the most logical thing when the reason you got there was you started helping as many people as possible. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's what got you there. It's like, oh, yeah, I made all these friends and, like, formed really meaningful relationships, and now I'm homeless. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it is funny, though. We, we, my wife and I run a group coaching program, which is a lot of fun because we serve a bunch of people and create access for folks that wouldn't otherwise. But um, I was coaching a gentleman and um, cause we'll do live coaching you know, and then everybody else gets to watch kind of thing. And what he wanted to be coached on was, well, I, I don't know what I should be doing. I don't have a plan or, you know, a big enough vision or whatever the hell he was talking about. And as we started to unpack that, what was really obvious is, is that at this moment in his life, everything is perfect. Like he's in a job that he loves. He's making great money. He has flexibility, he gets spent time with his kids. He's like, like, it's perfect. Like he's, he's exactly where he's wanted to be. And I'm like, so this really isn't about where you're trying to get to. It's how do you not fuck this up? That's really yeah, what right. you're wrestling with. Right, right. I said, well, okay, cool. Let's look at how you got here. Right? And as we unpacked the how we got here, what we found was this almost unbelievable journey of, of, of you know, coincidence and fortune and just shit that happened. He got fired six months ago, right? Devastated but then they needed him back. And like all these things happened from stuff that was totally out of his control. I said, so yeah. isn't this funny? We're, we're terrified of screwing up what we got. So, we, so we, we worry about the future and to solve for that and make sure the future's okay, even though we can't make it okay, we look to our past, which we didn't all have all as much to do with as we thought. So we're focusing on a bullshit story of our past to try to create some future that's not out of control, all the while forgetting and missing out on the beauty of what's right now. And, and we spend our whole life doing that. Right. Think, thinking that awesome and perfect is, 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 is somewhere else, right? It's just. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's really mm. fascinating. The last like 18 months or so of my life have been very transformative in that regard. And I'm a, I'm a Catholic, so <clears throat> my perspective on it is a more religious one than I think a lot of folks that tend to talk about these things in more of like the just human standpoint. But the message ends up being the same. And it's just funny to me how I've mm. realized that like, I am so like, I am this year, I have less control, have way more to worry about and less certainty about anything. And yeah. I'm more at peace than I've been in any other part of my life. And it's yeah. funny to me because like, n that's mm. all inside. It's all yeah. in the heart. It's of all in the head. Like it's, am I, you know, <clears throat> it's just funny. <laughs> well, it, it is, but it's also the truth. Our, our happiness, our security, our safety, our, it's created from within. Right, one hundred percent. You cannot, you cannot create a state of being through doing. Right, right. Yet we spend all our time doing, get the right job, blah blah. blah trying to change what's within. Now, for me, what's 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 even funnier than that is, once you stop trying to create your state of being, a positive state of being through all you're doing, and you say, oh, the being happens from within. The stuff that's created from that place of positive being is remarkable, right? We think we're gonna have the experience we want by figuring out our circumstances and controlling them. When we turn it around and say, I'm gonna focus on my experience and we create a really amazing experience of life, holy shit, our circumstances get really good without a lot of work. Right. That's- It's fascinating. It's magic, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Townsend, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for uh, thanks for talking with me. Um, yeah, man. Is there anything is there anything specific that you uh, any other kind of message that you have based on some of the conversations you've been having? You think is important for people to hear? I think the most important thing for people to hear is actually a very simple message, and that is everything is okay. Everything's going to be okay. And uh, I was working with a gentleman about a month ago, and and he's legitimately dealing some circumstances of life that, that are very challenging. Uh, a, a business has gone down, some, some real exposure financially, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I looked at him, I said, do you know in your heart everything's going to be okay? Do you know that? And he goes, well, no. I said, well, I do. <laughs> and he goes, well, how do you know? I said, well, <laughs> because you're here. <laughs> and you got here somehow. And that's a pretty good indication, right? So, you know, he's, he's like my age, 50 or whatever. I said, 
your whole life you've worried things happen, and, and yet they're okay. So that's pretty good, that's pretty good odds, right? 100% of your life so far has been okay. And he goes, well, it hasn't been okay. I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, this happened a lot, and we had to sleep on, a, on my mom's couch. I said, well, that's, that's uncomfortable, but you're still okay, and, and you got here. He goes, well, but it almost wasn't. And I just, I broke out laughing. I'm like, oh, so not only are we going to worry about the future, we're going to go to the past and make up stories about how it could have not been okay. All right, knock it off. It's going to be okay. It is okay. Right, right. Yeah. So that's, that's my awesome. message. Relax. Everything's going to be okay. Even if it seems like it's not, I promise it's going to be okay. Yeah. That's how it works. Awesome. All right, well, thanks, Townsend. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, if you guys, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, Townsend, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, just send an email, uh, connect at townsendwardlaw.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Instagram. I just post there a little bit. But yeah, LinkedIn's my primary place of doing that. Just whatever, whatever medium works well, uh, send me a message. I'll find a way to help. Awesome. Great. I encourage anybody who's, uh, who watches this to take Townsend up on that. Um, his <clears> content, even if you just follow his content, it's always been very uh, great, great to follow. So thanks again, Towns, for coming on. Have a great uh, rest of your week, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, John.